Hi, my name is Jim Arabito, and I'm a Seventh-day Adventist layman. As a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm very, very interested in the fulfillment of prophecies in these last days. Especially am I aware of the place of Roman Catholicism in closing events. Well, I was on a street ministry in Berkeley about 10 years ago. I became acquainted with a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest from the University of San Francisco. I asked him in one of our conversations, have you read The Great Controversy? And he explained to me that The Great Controversy has a lot of truth in it. In fact, he told me that the Roman Catholic Church will rule the world again. For a while, I was in a state of shock. You know, it just happens to be that although we're Seventh-day Adventists, Many times we don't see in reality the very things that we supposedly believe. It hit me very hard, and I began about 10 years ago collecting books on Roman Catholicism and world politics. You know, we as Adventists expect somehow to see all these events take place out in the open. But you know I found that that is not what Revelation 17 tells us. Revelation 17, verse 3 says this, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. Well, a scarlet-colored beast is all the political powers that are going to pull together to destroy the commandments of God. The woman riding on that beast is Roman Catholicism and fundamental Christianity. John describes these things as taking place in the wilderness. Now, in reading Revelation chapter 12, we know that when the primitive church fled persecution, she went into the wilderness. And in Great Controversy, page 55, Ellen White tells us that the wilderness is a symbol that represents obscurity and seclusion. This means that at the end of time, Roman Catholicism is working in secret with the rulers of this world in an effort to control the world, to take it over. And I believe that time is right upon us. You know, I plan to put together a documentary film called The Missing Dimensions in World Affairs. And for that film, I had gathered together interviews with people who had had either personal experiences with infiltration of Jesuits or Catholic priests, or in one instance, an interview with an ex-Jesuit priest by the name of Alberto Rivera, and another, a secret agent uh, for the federal government working for the Pentagon during the Second World War, and his wife was a chief stenographer of the Pentagon. All the funds that went over to Europe for the troops passed first through the Vatican. This man had had personal um, working relationships with Roman Catholic priests, and listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. I had to stop my plans to do this documentary and decide to just get these things before you right now. The Jesuit priests have been infiltrating every institution, and they're ready now for a takeover. I want you to pay close attention to this first uh, person that we're going to interview. He's an ex-Jesuit priest. And he tells you about the, um, the, the infiltration by the Jesuits. A, a special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government. Uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was? What for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and, and, and through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society 
in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his state, of his, of his country. But that means he is the head of a political state. Both combinations are in one office there. In, in prophetically speaking, that is what we see in the book of Revelation. Uh, uh, the political power always hand to hand with the religious power. I was in Chicago years ago, and I was canvassing as a car porter selling Bible rings from Home Circle. And we come to one great big mansion where uh, the folks were rich in that area and cars all around it and so forth. But I went up the door and I was pretty sure this fellow was Catholic, so I gave him a Catholic canvas. And he invited me in. And then as soon as he got in, he turned the key and, and the door. And I said, wait a minute, what am I getting into? He opened another door into a great big mammoth parlor and a great big mammoth dining room with double doors in between and all seated around the whole business was uh, uh, prelates from some from Europe and all the big ones from America. They were planning the Eucharistic Congress in Chicago. That was way back in the 1920s. And uh, when uh, they started talking to me, they tried to get me to be one of them and offered me every kind of a conceivable opportunity that you could think of. They offered me everything, money, scholarship, and the whole works and told me the advantage of being Catholic and what they were planning on doing in America and with America. They said, we're going to take over America and, they, and we've already got it fixed, so know how in the world can they escape becoming under our authority and where well, we'll be in the jurisdiction and take over. I said, well, how are you going to take over the South? It's, it's uh, predominantly Protestant. I said, we're going to seed the South with Catholic families. And then when they marry into the Protestants, their children will be raised Catholic, and before long we'll have uh, a quarter, and then we'll have a third, then we'll have over half, and when we get over half, we, we've got America. That's one way of doing it. But it says that we've got other ways, too. Well, I said, supposing all this was known, and the people, Protestants, knew this, uh, he said, if they knew what we were planning on doing, there'd be bloodshed in 24 hours and lots of them in 48. I said, are you prepared to take over in case that, that happens? He said, yes, we have our standing armies. We have everything all prepared with guns, ammunition, and the whole works. And uh, said, uh, we can take over, and you might as well join us and be in the, with us and, and get in on the uh, right side of the fence. I said to him, I said, listen, there is nothing you can do to invigor me to become a Catholic. I mean nothing. I said, I know my horse is going through to eternity, and I'm riding on it. And I know your horses aren't, and I know that you'll be nonplussed entities when I'll be enjoying eternity and having a good time forever. And I'm going to see to it that I'm on the right side of the fence. And I know which side I'm on now. And uh, I said, you might as well open the door and let me out because I know that other people know that I'm in here and there'll be an investigation made if, if you don't let me out. One of the big fellows with a red cardinal hat got up and said, sir, he says, we're going to let you out. But we want you to know one thing. 
that everybody that's born in the United States that's not born a Catholic is on a card. You're put on a white card to begin with and kept on a white card until we feel like that we need to watch you. After that, we put you on a blue card and said after you're on a blue card for a while, if we feel like it, we just assume you wasn't existing, you're on a red card. So from now on, you'll be on the red card as long as you live. And I know they know me where I'm living and have followed me all around throughout life. They're still doing it. And, uh, well, I could tell you a lot of stories, but that's just one. Yes, it was in 1967 when a friend of mine came to me very excitedly. He told me that he was doing some call porter work in Indiana. And while knocking uh, on different doors to gain entrance, he was invited into a home very quickly. And he wondered how come he didn't have to use his door openers. When he went in, the fellow who uh, had invited him into his home said, I know who you people are. And he said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, let me show you something here. And he moved uh, aside a rug from uh, his flooring there, and under that rug was a door. He lifted up the door, and here were stairs that went down into a basement. And he said, I would like to show you something. So they went down into the basement, and this individual whose home he was in uh, showed him just many files. And as he was looking at these files, he wondered what it meant. He says, well, he says, we know who you are, and I would like to ask you a question. Name me a name of somebody who belongs to your church. And so he said, okay, he named him a name, one of his uh, girlfriends. And he, this man went to a file, picked out that name, and said, this person was baptized on such and such a date, a member of such and such a church, etc. And my friends said his eyes got very large, and he says, well, what does this mean? How come you have this information here? And this fellow said, well, I belong to the Catholic Church. I belong to a special order. And we have all of you on files in different parts of the country. This is the file that we have on your members of your church here. We know who you are, and we have more complete records on you than I believe you people have for yourself. He said, I just wanted you to see that so you would know that we know who you are. Well, my friend left that home. He didn't sell any books, but I think he became a, a more serious uh, thinking individual after that. Because I was always able to open up to anybody that I cared anything about, even a friend, much less your husband. And he was this way all the time I was married to him. Very evasive. Was he gone for long periods? Or? Yes, he was. He was gone for three and four months, sometimes out of the year, sometimes a less amount of time, but always no, no less than six weeks at a time. And he would act so bitter when he left. He'd get me all upset to where I'd tell him, why, why don't you leave, Joe? And so he'd act so sad, but he'd leave. And I saw later that he really intended it to be this way. He was manipulating you. Right. That's true. Mm -hmm. Did he show any remorse? Not really. No, it was just as though that was his line of work. Very dear neighbors that lived across the street from me and they knew my husband, and they had known us for years. And so when Joe and I were married, and he would try to communicate with them, but I don't know if he was revealing anything to them that he wasn't saying to me. But these folks told me, they were first to tell me that Joe, in fact, was a priest. Many of my friends questioned Joe in their own minds not to his face, but they thought he was a very strange person. They thought it was strange that he'd have so many absences from our marriage. But of course, I took all the blame for that, not fully realizing that he was irritating me to the point of sending him away these times when it was necessary, in fact, that he was away. Because his church, I'm sure he had the calling that he had to answer or the work that he had to do for his church. At what point were you sure 
that you had married somebody pretty high up in the Roman Catholic Church. When he had finally convinced me that it'd be wise for us to marry in his church, and I had belonged to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, or I guess I hadn't yet been baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but I felt that it probably would be smart to marry him in the Catholic Church. And so I went ahead, and then we went over to see a priest in Reno and was going to discuss being married. We had to go over to another office, another group of offices, and see a cardinal. And so we, when we went to discuss our marriage with the cardinal, Joe was rather talking down to the cardinal, and I felt this was sort of unusual because realizing just common knowledge that that people didn't talk down to a cardinal if they were Catholics. And I thought that to be a bit strange, and the cardinal took Joe. Uh, the two of them walked away, supposedly out of range of my hearing. And that's when I realized that he, in fact, was a Catholic priest. And he had told me that he was going to, what was that word I wanted to use? Excommunicate. He, he wanted to excommunicate himself. And I thought, this is strange, a man that devoted to church wants to excommunicate himself. And then when I heard the discussion about the priesthood, I threw up the papers and I said, I've had it. I'm going to quit. This is it. I'm not going to be married. When you heard what discussion about the priesthood? Well, I could hear little bits about uh, your position and this position and that position. It was just very scanty, but I knew that it was, at this time, discussing his priesthood. How long had you been actually married to him at this time? About? Oh, six years, I guess. I threw the papers up, yes. What I have here, I gathered up. I noticed that even my divorce papers are gone, but uh, I don't know what's happened to those, but you did see the papers the wedding certificate that I have, and um, I don't know what happened to the divorce certificate. Did you take any pictures of Joe? Well, there were lots of pictures made, yes. We had many made. And then what happened to them? They were taken. We I don't know where, where they went, but I don't have any pictures left of him at all now. Did he take them? I don't believe so. I don't believe so, but who knows? But you don't have any pictures of Joe today? No, none whatsoever. You'd mentioned that uh, someone had broken into to, to your house and stolen? Yeah, uh, some of the things were taken from me, stolen from me, yes. Who would want pictures? There must have been something else packed in that box. I'm sure there was. Or who knows? It's a crazy thing. There were quite a few things missing even personal pictures of my children and grandchildren. Now, he made a boast one day about Hitler. What oh, exactly yes. did he say about Hitler? He said Hitler was one of our very good people. Hitler and Mussolini, he said, you know, were good Catholics. And he said also the Mafia. He said, we have, we have some good people in our church. When I showed him the book that I had gotten, written by Samuel Bacchiocchi, he said, that's one of our men. And uh, so he said, notice where it was published. And he turned right away to, to the area in the front of the book where it tells you published in Rome. And he pointed that out very carefully to me. Are you telling me that in the same breath that he mentioned Hitler and Mussolini, that he mentioned Samuel Bacchiocchi? I'm not sure of that. I'm really not sure of that. I don't know that that was at the same time. How did you all. feel when he said that? Did you think he was kidding you? Yeah. I thought he was jesting a lot of the times. And I would question him about it. And there were, he really wasn't jesting at all. Mm -hmm. But you had the feeling that he was. Joe was a very sober person, and it was difficult to know when he was joking, which was seldom. He was very serious. He had a serious mission within him that he carried out. 
I was reared in Pasadena in Southern California, which is only a few miles from Glendale, where Merle Vance used to speak on Sabbath afternoons in his uh, discussions of the Catholic Church with the number 666 and how paganism had worked into the church. It was intensely interesting. Even I've used some of the things he has said even yet, yet today. But he had these uh, mimeograph sheets that he used to pass out that had the pictures that he had copied from his various publications. I know he did a lot of study when he went back to the seminary. He was studying on the connection between 666 and the Roman church. And when he went to the seminary, some of the people there said, well, now we think we know that there's a Jesuit on the staff here. And we think we know who it is. Merle hadn't been there very long until he said, I think I knew who it was too. Well, he continued his study and he had pictures from the books that were printed in Rome by the church. And this is what was on these mimeograph sheets that he used to pass out. But at the height of his study, he took some of this amazing material which he had and took it to one of the leaders there in Washington and showed him what they had. This man, without even looking at the paper that Merle had, said, Brother Vance, that study is not for you. But he said, look what I've got. It's all here. It's proved. Here's the pictures. Here's the proof of it. There's no question. He said, Brother Vance, that material and that subject is not for you. Well, he was pretty downhearted. He went to his major professor, which was a professor of history, and he showed him what he had. This professor said, we want you to write your term paper on that. Well, he said, I'm sorry, but I've already talked with this leader and he gave his name and he says that I must not study this any further. So I don't dare write a term paper on it. Well, time went on and uh, some of his friends said if he didn't change his topic, he wouldn't ever graduate. In fact, a major professor said that. So he did change his topic to something inconsequential. Finally, the time came for Merle's graduation from the seminary and it just happened that this leader was, had been called to Europe for a year, and it was during that year that Merle was graduated. So he had his papers. Following that, this leader died, and a very close friend of this leader was talking with Merle one day, and he said, I know positively that that leader, that that man was a Jesuit because I was a very close friend of him, and I know this positively. Merle was certainly a good student. I remember him when I heard a tape of him recently. I, I recognized his voice. It was so thrilling to hear his voice again because I enjoyed those messages which he gave. He was a good student, a fine man, a real scholar. Uh, certainly he was a credit to this people. The subject of Jesuit infiltration into Protestant churches, whenever that subject is brought up, it's often ignored, dismissed, or just uh, brushed aside. For some reason, they don't like to think of this fact. But the story I'm about to tell you occurred in 1939 at a Seventh-day Adventist institution, Washington Missionary College located in Tacoma Park, Maryland. This was told to me by Dr. B.G. Wilkinson, who was president of the college from 1935 to 1945. Now, Dr. Wilkinson told me that he uncovered a Jesuit infiltrator at that time, in 1939. And this is how it happened. There had been a new Bible instructor hired by the board. And this man had been teaching Bible to the undergraduate theological majors for about five months. Now, Dr. Wilkinson had always encouraged an open-door policy, and he encouraged the confidences of his students, especially his theological students. Now, some of these young men came to him after a period of about four or five months, and they said, Dr. Wilkinson, there's, you know, you, you teach Bible differently than this new Bible instructor does. There's some things about him that we don't understand. He brings up doubts in the classroom doubts about our theological position, about our doctrines. These doubts are then not resolved. They're left sort of hanging in the air. And they had other questions, which 
Dr. Wilkinson couldn't, couldn't answer. It aroused Dr. Wilkinson's suspicions about this man. Now, the teachers had in, in uh, old Columbia Hall uh, little pigeonholes, boxes where they mail uh, slots, you know. They used to uh, put their uh, mail in these little pigeonholes and the faculty would come and pick up their, their letters. Uh, this one day, uh, Wilkinson saw an envelope being placed by the mailman in the mail slot for this uh, Bible teacher. And the letter was a rather long, rectangular, official-looking letter. And after the mailman left, Dr. Wilkinson stepped over to the box and he drew the letter out. And he looked at it, and the return address was a Hereford Road address. Now, Wilkinson knew that that was a Jesuit college. It wasn't located too far from Washington Missionary College. He took the letter and he steamed it open. Of course, this was an illegal act. But, you know, when you're dealing with a class like they are, they committed many illegal acts in their time, the assassination of princes being the least of their illegal acts. And, you know, the Jesuit motto is the end justifies the means. Wilkinson thought, I'm going to steam this letter open. And if, if it's an innocent thing, I'll just close it up again, say nothing. He steamed it open, and inside he found orders from this young man's superior, telling the young man, outlining to him, what he was to preach or, or teach uh, in his Bible class for the next several months. Dr. Wilkinson reinserted the letter, gummed the flap back on. He called the young teacher in. He said to this young man, he had the letter on his desk, you know, and he said to this young man, I have a piece of mail for you. And he handed it to him. And he said, he says, we know who you are, and we know why you are here. You are a Jesuit, are you not? The young man looked across the desk at Dr. Wilkinson. He picked up his mail, turned on his heel, and walked out. And it was the last they ever saw of this man. He never even stopped to pick up his pay. But he cleared off of that campus the very same hour. When I was in detective work in Washington, D.C. during World War II, I was going home to Alexandria, Virginia, from Washington, D.C., and when I got to the mall, there was two scholars, and they were sticking up their fingers for a ride. I says, I'll just pick them up and put them in the back seat and see what I can find out from them. And so when they got in the back seat and was seated, I asked them, I said, you boys are from Georgetown University taking the priesthood, aren't you? No. We're not taking the priesthood, they said. Well, I said, you're scholars from Georgetown University taking something. What are you taking? <coughs> they said, we're Anglican brothers. Well, I said, I've never, the church has never told us what Anglican brothers are, nor uh, much about them, and I don't know much about them. What uh, do the Anglican brothers do, and what are they for? They said, well, we're taking uh, studies to uh, work with the Protestant churches and get them to come into the do what the church wants them to do and to work with them and work with us. And uh, I said, well, how many of you folks are taking the course? We said, well, about 780. And uh, I said, how many graduates? Oh, somewhere between 780 and 700 and 800. Uh, no, 700 and, uh, and 780. I said, now, uh, uh, how many graduated last year? And they told me. And then I said, the year before that. And they told me. And I went back to We had about 3,800 people graduated and out in the field. 
And I said, well, what do you boys do when you go out in the field? No, I said, at first I want to know uh, uh, how, how many will graduate next year. Well, it said it would be somewhere under 900 anyway. And I said, how, how about, uh, what do you do when you uh, graduate? He said, well, the first thing, we change our names. And when we change our names, then we're allocated so many to this church, so many to that church, and to another church. And I said, when you go out to the churches, then what do you do? He said, well, the first thing we do is look around for some nice young lady that we'd like to make an a associate member uh, with, and then uh, we marry them. And after we're married, we go off to a, a Protestant a theological seminary or school, and we come out a Protestant minister. Then we're taught to, in our course, to work up to the heads as fast as we can in that line, and where we're supposed to work in. And uh, I said, now, uh, do all of you work in the same field? No, says some of us work, but we all work in the church, trying to get the churches to unite with us and do what they want. Us, we want them to do. So were these Roman Catholic uh, students then? They were. As far as I learned, from what I learned, they were Jesuits. I know they don't only infiltrate the Protestant churches, but they infiltrate their schools. And I know one fellow that got to be teacher in the Methodist school, and as a result of that, a lot of the Methodist uh, ministers today are carrying communist cards. They utilize anything and everybody to bring their uh, means to an end. My story goes back a few years ago my father first got the ministry, Pastor Arabio, he was sent by a general conference to Reno, Nevada, which was his first uh, ministry among the Italian-speaking people. At that time, there were quite a few that had migrated from the east to the west, and especially in the Reno area. So a call went out for a young minister, and my dad was ready and willing and consecrated to do his part in the ministry. He was a young minister at that time. And uh, he was sent to Reno, Nevada. And from there, he was sent to, uh, a call came through not long after that, after there was 40 to 50 members, a call came through to go to San Francisco. And of course, a minister has to always be willing to to uh, whether he wanted to or not to go where he was called. And the call came through and he did. He went to uh, San Francisco to open up the work there among the Italian speaking people. Of course, at that time, we never had any thought of uh, who the Jesuits were and what they were about to do and what they were doing, even at that time, and that was some time ago. Anyway, uh, after he uh, was there a while, he got a call to go to Oakland to work among the Thai speaking people. And he was told that he would be working side by side with a man by the name of Calderoni, Elder Rosario Calderoni, who would be in charge of the Italian work of that area. So my dad went and uh, took orders from Elder Calderoni. He worked in Oakland and El Cerrito and Richmond for a while, bringing people to church and working with them in Bible studies, and many souls were baptized at that time due to the work which promoted that area. At that time, he became friendly with Elder Calderoni, and in one instance, Elder Calderoni admitted that he was raised and sent to, the, to school, to the Roman Catholic school back in Italy, and he was going to be a Jesuit. He was an, an admitted Jesuit at that time. And uh, he said that he broke away from the Jesuits and became an Adventist because he saw that they didn't have the truth. Well, naturally we all believed him. But it wasn't long after that when Dad would answer a call to the Stockton area to raise a little church in the Stockton area, which he went. And of course, all this time, he was under, under the uh, 
direction of Aldo Rosario Calderoni. And uh, that's when we realized that there was something wrong. Aldo Calderoni, at that time, we didn't know, but was gradually destroying the work that was being done among the Italian speaking people. The people would come in and complain and that money was being sent to Calderoni and wondered where was what was happening to it. And all the while, why uh, he was visiting people and speaking against the ones, the young people, including my dad, that had, had uh, newly come into truth at that time. Many of the young Italian ministers at that time were being dropped, one by one, for one excuse and another. And uh, we found out it was Calderoni speaking to Elder Houswick, who at that time was in charge of the foreign work. And we were wondering why this was happening. It was happening. So the, the church was being undermined. We just don't know how it was happening until later, of course, we realized that it we felt that it was because of the background and possibly Elder Calderon was still in the, in the work, uh, the Jesuits pay or, or under their direction. It had to be, because otherwise the work was, would have gone ahead because it, it went ahead so beautifully before that. Friends, I can only tell you of one incident, but of course I hear of many others. And if one person can get into the, our work and do cause a destruction among the tired speaking people, I, I shudder to think of how many more are doing the same thing today. That was my father, John Arbido, who was kept from the ministry by Jesuit influences in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Adventists should wake up. Time is short. What organizations have now been taken over by the Jesuit order and other institutes of Catholicism? What world powers are in her hands to be used in this final chess game for the takeover of the world? We can get some idea when we look back to the Council of Trent in the 1540s through the 1560s. At that time, and during those years, we find vows that were taken by these secret orders to take over the education of the Protestants, take over their schools, take over their churches, especially to destroy the Protestant Bible by creating many translations, destroy the monarchies of Europe, destroy nationalism, to use astronomy and astrology to create new calendars that would eventually transfer the sanctity from Sabbath or Saturday to Sunday. Their goal was to take over the business world, internationalism. They were to take over banking, to take over Judaism and the movement of Zionism, to create political strife and chaos and all of these things for one end, that Catholicism should rule. Listen. I did training in monasteries and common, uh, where I prepare cursigistas, uh, 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 the Legion of Mary, uh, the uh, Blue uh, Army, uh, uh, many of these militants organizations. Uh, I train and prepare how they can become Baptists, how they can become Adventists, how they can become uh, 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 Methodists, how they can become Presbyterian, how they can become Pentecostal, and all these areas where they must infiltrate any area. You bring up one of the other questions I have, might as well ask it now, uh, particularly the Blue Army. Is that in some way connected with the uh, Fatima? Fatima. That's correct. Is yes. that that to to um, protect it, or that, to that they are they are the army that creates the greatest promotion of that cult, yeah. of that satanic cult here in the United States. Okay. In every country, uh, the Roman Catholicism display this promotion uh, uh, to the uh, so-called Virgin. There is not uh, uh, even uh, Mary uh, the. The, the Mary that we know in the Gospel, but a distortion of right. that really, truly Mary of the Gospel, uh, they display to different 
militant organizations the promotional need for certain sane or virgin or whatever. And yeah. bl the Blue Army is the greatest promoter of the call to marry here in the United States. The Opus Dei is another arm of the Jesuits. What that means, you have Masons, uh, you have uh, Illuminatis, okay. you have uh, uh, the uh, you have the New Age movement, uh, uh, you have um, uh, the Trilateral Commission, you have the Club of Rome, uh, uh, you have uh, so many others. They are in different areas working uh, 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 through certain programs. What they need in that particular area, of where these organizations move, these uh, whether are secret or public organizations, they need to control certain area of certain uh, uh, people and, and this is where and how they'll be ready to have them under control through these organizations. The Opus Dei mainly, they move uh, next to what they call Christian de uh, dem uh, democracy. Uh, the so-called Christian democracy is an outgrowth of this Opus Dei. It's exactly the words in Latin precisely define that. Uh, uh, the Latin uh, definition is uh, for Opus Dei is the work of God. <laughs> what, they, what that means, the Opus Dei. Opus uh, meaning uh, the work, uh, and then uh, you have uh, how you call them, uh, Dei, Opus Dei, the work of God. When the Council of Trent occurred, it was controlled by the Jesuits. Yes. How about the Vatican II? Is now, there a connection? Yes, there? the connection is very, very very prophetical. I will say uh, this, and uh, I think that uh, will clear the whole uh, point here, because it's so prophetical that while the Council of Trent was the first consul to be managed by the Jesuit order, the Vatican Council was brought about by the same Jesuit order with the same intention, and you know the intention of the Council of Trent. The intention behind the Council of Trent was the Counter-Reformation. What was the intent of the Vatican Council II? Another Counter-Reformation, but called today, how you call it? Renewal. You see the point? Now, the change was a name, but the intentions were the same. Yes. See, more sophisticated today. Yes. You see, the Counter-Reformation was taken through the, uh, to the Council of Trent. That was the entire Counter Reformation was uh, performed by the Council of Trent decrees. Then, through that time until today, Vatican Council II came about with the idea of renewal. That means another a step forward and the final. I will say this is the final stage of a Counter Reformation. Now, how about the charismatic movement? What's what's the connection with that? The charismatic movement is serving the purpose. Uh, as we said, of uh, one of the many issues, uh, as we said about Saturdays and Sunday, uh, they'll pick it up every issue with different denominations. In the case of the charismatic movement, they pick up the, the charismatic movement because one factor, they could not bring under subjection the Pentecostal denominations. They couldn't. They could not. Even when they went to the ecumenical movement before, from 1945 down to our day, since at this uh, already starts, as a matter of fact, if you want to know, the World Council of Churches started by financed by the Jesuits in Europe in 1945 after the end of the Second World War already, or by the time that the World War was uh, to end, it, already the Jesuits were at work trying to unite all the Protestants in Europe. Uh, and that was the origin of the World Council of Churches and the Ecumenical Movement. Today the Charismatic Movement is serving that purpose. Where the Pentecostal could not be brought into the Ecumenical Forum, they brought it through the exercise of Charismatic Gift. We were on the way back from London on the jet plane, and there was a man dressed in a uniform like the Catholic priest wear, and he was uh, conducting himself not like a, a priest You'd see in a movie, very friendly. He was a very sophisticated type man. And uh, people could sense that. And I never thought I'd see him again. But in Baltimore, at the uh, airline uh, station, where the uh, baggage has come off, well, I turned around, and there he was next to me. And I just turned to him and said, Hello, friend. Are you a Jesuit? 
And he says, yes, with a big smile. You see all of his teeth. And he uh, uh, was very happy with himself. I, I said, well, listen, I'm very interested in, in the Jesuits. I've, I've read some about them. And what, is it, what, what would you think about the, the Council of Trent and what was invented in the Council of Trent and the infiltration of the Jesuits into Protestantism and the use of the Jesuits through organizations like the Illuminati and the Futurism theory, the secret rapture that they invented for the Protestants. And I talked to him about a lot of those things and he, he had a, like a metamorphosis take place. His, his face became rigid, his smile went away, and he looked me right in the eyes and he said, you know quite a bit, don't you? Like uh, he never expected it. And I told him that, that um, you know, I was one of the Protestants that got away. And, and if he could uh, realize that if somebody like me knew those things, just imagine some of the other of God's people that know those things and are willing to tell anybody about them. And it was, a, it was an amazing situation how that man's face changed. And, and he thought he was like in one identity. But all of a sudden he realized that these dark secrets of theirs, they're being found out. And uh, I'll never forget that. Would you consider that Jesuitism uh, to be an occult secret society? It is. It is an occult secret society from the point of view that the Jesuit order, what you know of the Jesuit order and what everybody knows of the Jesuit order is not the true, the truly Jesuit order. What that means is even the Jesuits within the Jesuit order, they all are not knowing the secret society, the inner secret society that they are surrendered by. Spiritualism and the papacy is as close as two fingers are on your hand. One cult that started Fra Fatima, okay, the cult of Fatima, the Roman Catholic cult, seems to, to be antagonistic to the rest of the Roman Catholic Church. Seems that they believe that the, the, the pope that's in uh, now is, is an antichrist. The whole thing is that Satan gets as many people as he can on his side. And by starting something else up, he can get more. Oh, I see. And he starts first one thing and then another. That's why he's got so many churches and so many cults and so many this and so many that. What he can't get one person on, he gets them on another. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing that he gets most people on is TV. Satan has all kinds of organizations. Mm -hmm. But the, the uh, Catholic Church is his one biggest, most extensive organization that there is in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He has these others organized to take care of things, but, and in some places he works even destroys himself to make other things work out to see. Himself. What's the connection between Jesuitism and communism? Well, that's a long story, but really, uh, communism was really started by the Catholic Church, and the Pope himself is allied with him and a communist himself. They sent some Jesuits into a little town where they wanted to start Catholicism. Now this I learned from E.T. Babienko that worked with me <clears throat> on a lot of uh, uh, detective work that I did. And E.T. Babienko told me that after they had no success for a, a short while, they substituted the place with uh, twice as many Jesuits as they had in the beginning, and after years they get, got nowhere. So they said the only way in the big uh, meetings in uh, the Vatican, where the headmen all meet, they said the only way we'll ever get anywhere in putting Catholicism in Russia is to take away the children from the parents and do away with the Greek Orthodox ch Church by training the children otherwise. And in the, their brains, this was all formulated, and they decided to put communism into Russia, and to put hard boiled communism, which is Bolshevism, and, and later bring it on to a de-Christianized Christian Bolshevism. 
So the uh, the connection between Zionistic Judaism and communism then is, would you say that's a, a fraudulent story? Yes, to some extent, and yet they use the Jews wherever they can. So the Roman Catholic Church utilizes Judaism. They utilize anything and everybody to bring their uh, means to an end. So these um, writers that point to the international Jewish conspiracy, uh, drawing from historical material that appears to see the Jewish involvement in all this, may very well be part of the Catholic ploy to take the uh, heat off of themselves? Yes, and uh, it's, that's absolutely the truth. And uh, have you ever heard tell of this uh, book that the uh, uh, Zion had taken Protocol over? Protocol the Chief Elders of Zion. Yes. I have one of the books. They're hard to get. I can get them if necessary for anybody. But uh, I have ways and means of getting them, but it takes me a little while to get them. And uh, when you get them, you better keep them to yourself. But here's the thing. When the Zionists got all that underneath, the Catholics got a hold of some of this book, material in these books. And now, why do you think they that Hitler did away with all the, the uh, Jews for is to get rid of the heads and the ones that would promote the Zionism. And they're doing what the, the Zionists propose to do. So they, uh, the actually in reality then, there is a Zionist movement, but the Roman church is, is trying to take over it and control it. Yeah, it has, for their own purposes. They have a club of uh, 300 at, at Rome that does nothing but figure out how they can do it and why they can do it and where they can do it and why they can go ahead. The war in Vietnam was nothing more than just using the United States to put in Catholicism into Vietnam. What do you know about the uh, organization of the Knights of Columbus? I know too much. Too much, and too much to tell. Oh, I see. But I know one thing. And that is that they're a strong organization in the United States, and they have a lot to do with this here Mustache Army. The the Ustaches. Yes. When well, I was, are the Knights of Columbus also organized in other countries? You or, bet your life or they, they are. Are they financing the Ustaches of certain? Wherever they they're is in other countries they're organized. Where the Catholics are in force, they're organized. Well, is is the Knights of Columbus an extension of the Jesuit order? Well, but into secular they society? all they all work in the and with together. They're dovetailed. Do you know anything about the um, connection between Roman Catholicism and Masonry? They're tied in together. Would you say Roman Catholicism actually manipulates and controls Masonry? They're, they've, got, they've got to the place where they're in control of a lot of things, and they have a lot to do with Masonry. You know, one of the heads of Masonry at the head of things is a Catholic. One night he told you that they run our church. Tell us about that. His people run our church. He said. Who were his people? The Catholic Church. The Catholic Church run the all churches. He said that to you? Yes, yes. And specifically that the Catholic Church runs the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Well, um, very much like that. I don't recall exactly the way it was worded. This is the impression that I got from what he had said, the statement that he had made, we. He always said, whenever he said we, that was the church and he. He always included himself as the church. From Jeannie's testimony about her marriage to a Catholic priest agent, we get a sense of the tremendous confidence that the Roman Catholic Church has now in her position of dominating the nations and its institutions. Very soon we're going to be locked into a period of terrible persecution and there'll be many martyrs among the faithful Christians. 
Listen to the words of Revelation 17, verse 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. She is uniting with the rulers of the world. Listen. In verse 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Rulers in this world will give their political power to a system, a political system, that will be dominated by the papacy. And that system is going to make war upon God uh, and his followers. In Revelation 18, part of our last message to the world is to tell the world all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornications, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. That the governments of the world are in an unholy alliance with the Roman papacy, and God is going to judge them. I want you to listen very carefully to Dr. Hiram Duke's testimony as he shares their position in world politics. When I was behind these locked doors, mm -hmm. they told me that they were going to cede the South. And with what they told me then, I knew they were planning World War II. And I knew they were planning on bringing all the DPs and seeding the South with DPs. They've done it. They've got to the place now where... The, DP is... What's a DP? That's the folks who are uh, displaced in the old country on account of war. Well, one thing that's interesting is no bombs are dropped on the Vatican. Well, my wife was the head stenographer in the Vatican, I mean in the Pentagon at that time. Mm -hmm. And she gave all the orders and sent out all the orders to the big men. And she had orders to see that there was no Protestant flew over the Vatican and over Rome because they were afraid that they might, through uh, their own ingenuity, want to drop a bomb there. Are you aware that the had immigration authority in, in uh, Germany, was a strong Catholic, and that he let the men in that were trained in New York for the uh, hoodlums that went over to do away with the Tsar and his outfit, and they were shipped by him into Moscow by getting one of their men into Moscow. And, Egyptian boxcar and this fellow in Moscow that got in their head, went and opened the padlocks off of boxcar and, and let them out, and they went right up and did You're away talking with about them. Lenin and Trotsky. Yes, sir. Trotsky was trained in New York, wasn't he? Yeah. The head of a bunch of hoodlums. Got to talking with E.T. Babienko about a lot of things. And we got in places where we wanted to know things. And we put on uh, priest garbs dressed up like a priest, and he put on even garbs on the ground of priesthood. Well, because he spoke in 44 languages more fluent than I do in English, and his wife speaks 33 languages fluent, why, and he understands enough in other languages right away quick, and he picks them up like magic, the, Lord, the General Conference used him for interpreter to go between a lot of these places, wherever they needed him. And he went to Europe and went to Asia and a lot of these different things. And when he went to, to uh, Asia, uh, he was over in the Himalaya Mountains, uh, where it's so difficult to learn a language. Uh, he learned some things was going on in Europe, and he wanted to go over and find it out. So he took an airplane, and he flew over there, and he dressed up like a big head man in the Catholic Church, and he went in with, among these other men, and he purported that he could, couldn't understand their language, they had to get him an interpreter. So they got him an interpreter, and he understood their language better than they did. And he understood everything they were saying, and everything they were saying about him. And uh, that way, why, he, he fooled them to where they thought he was a high dignitary, and he went in and found out things that he wouldn't otherwise. When uh, And uh, he found out when he went to uh, Europe that they were planning on getting rid of the uh, Greek Orthodox Catholic Church. And one reason they tried to, the, the Illuminati tried to put a bank in Russia, 
and uh, they couldn't get the bank in Russia because uh, uh, the fact that the Tsar was too Tsar was too uh, uh, smart for them. And so they said, well, the only thing we can do is do away with the Tsar. And uh, what years was it? Well, this was way back in in the time of uh, before the World War One. to get, not only get rid of the Tsar, but they wanted to get Catholicism in, into Russia. And they were trying this before they tried to get the money bank in there. And when they sent, I think it was a thousand Jesuits into Russia, most of them were centered around a little country town and a little place in Russia. And they tried it for over a year and they didn't make any headway. So they sent uh, twice as many more in that area, and then they didn't get anywhere. So they called a big meeting over in uh, Rome of all the head folks from all over the world, and they planned on what they could do, and they found out that the best thing they could do was to get rid of the parents taking care of their children, to educate the children, and, and that way if they took the children away from the parents that they could uh, control and get Catholicism in their lady, later. So they put in hard-shelled Bolshevik communism. And uh, they said, well, we'll uh, know that and, and get it toys in that way later on and put in a de-Christianized Christian communism. And they planned all this ahead. And he, he learned this. When uh, uh, he got uh, this information, and they found out that they had, had they done this already, and that uh, he they take the children away so that they could imbibe communism into the children and take them away from do away with the Greek Orthodox Catholic Church, and then they could control and later get things into Russia, and control Russia, and uh, they do away with the Tsar and the government and the whole works, and then they planned on do it in World War One. They dined, wined, and educated 300 hoogans in New York to do all this and to go over and take over the Tsar and take over Russia and put this Bolshevism in Russia. Well, when they got it all ready, they had already gotten their man. The first president that they really put in was Woodrow Wilson. And uh, they had gotten him in office, and so they told Woodrow Wilson, you tell England if she don't let those men in the ship that you've captured go on into France and things go on through, that we won't bring the United States in and won't do anything for you, and you'll be out of luck. And so immediately they let the ship go on into France and, and it went into Switzerland, down into the uh, dark forest, and... Uh, the head man of migration was a Catholic, and he loaded one of them on the train and got him into Moscow through one crook or another. And then when he got him into Moscow, he loaded the rest of the 300 with all their guns, ammunition, and, and uh, money, $20 million in gold, uh, in boxcars, and sent them in there. When they got there, this fellow that was in Moscow, open up the boxcars that they were sent to him, and out they come and went right straight up and took the Tsar over, and they were scared for a long time that they weren't going to uh, make the grade, but they did. And uh, 
communism was in Russia. Now, after they got that all done, then this fellow decided there's something going on and I'd like to know a little more about some of these things. So a little later, he went over to a new part of, of uh, the Balkan states and went in dressed up the same as he did before. And he found out that uh, uh, they were, they'd called uh, uh, the uh, fam folks from all over the world into the Vatican to plan for things in the future and uh, that they were planning on putting a, w a new war into a uh, Second World War and that they planned and put Hitler in to do it. And uh, he found out the reasons it was all done and why they had it when they did have was that the young folks in Germany were falling for Bolshevism and communism and the young folks in the Catholic Church in Italy were doing the same. And they said, well, we've got to put something in there that's as near like it that they'll fall for and control this situation. And so they finally, after considering a lot of things and so forth, they uh, said, we, we, we've got to do something because something's got to be done. They, they put out a, a magazine uh, among these young folks to stop them from... Uh, uh, turning Bolshevik and communist oriented and uh, it was so bad that they decided that they'd have to do something because Russia put out another magazine that told it way back before this they had controlled another country with the same kind of government and it was in such and such books and such and such libraries in Europe and they printed what was in the books and in these magazines. It had such a percussion that they said, we've got to do something else. We've got to control this situation. So they said, we'll put in Nazism in Russia that was born in their brains and fascism in, in uh, Italy. And we'll pick our men. And they had Hitler picked and his face altered to do the job. They sent what money. What do you mean by his face altered? Well, they altered his nose and different things. Oh, really? And uh, then they picked Mussolini for Italy and they sent th uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to begin the situation and it went through the Swiss banks into Germany. I know of that uh, from what about E.T. Babienka told me. And uh, when they got the whole thing started, uh, it was all planned, fascism, and that's how Hitler got to be head of the German army. What about all of his occult interests? You know, uh, well, that's all Aryan, planned. Northern European race stuff, the hollow earth, and all that. That's stuff. all invented stuff that they worked out together. This mine comp that he was supposed to write was hired to be done by a man in England, and uh, he never wrote it at all. And uh, as far as I could learn, and Bobby Enko could learn, and uh, then they went through with the Nazi. Uh, works in the German, uh, World War II that you all know about. And uh, now we have a breakdown in the communism. It isn't the old Bolshevik communism. And Catholicism is being put in Russia. And our work is going forward because they couldn't let Catholicism in without letting us in. And they're still holding down on things. But they're using Catholicism to gain control of the whole world. Over 50% of the world are, is communist today. I'll tell you something else uh, that you might be interested in, and that is that when Woodrow Wilson was uh, put in, the Catholics brought in enough Catholics from Europe with the understanding that they were to vote Democrat to throw the election for Woodrow Wilson. It's a pity to have even to say that at this point in the history of the United States, in the history of the presidents, there has not been other president uh, from the time of President Washington that was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits 
to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, throughout all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy, because no other president has come as close as President Reagan with the Vatican, and even uh, uh, not even John F. Kennedy. What that means is they have done to President Kennedy, uh, to President Reagan, what they w were not able to do even through a Roman Catholic president. And nevertheless, I will say this: uh, uh, the 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 uh, religious uh, belief of President Kennedy is nothing more, nothing else than another expression of Catholicism. Uh, perhaps I need to uh, to clear this. Uh, Roman Catholicism is not only the Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism is still and it has been at work outside the Roman Catholic system. What that means, there are many daughters of the Roman Catholic system outside the Roman Catholic system. And as there are many daughters, these daughters have uh, children, and of course, President Reagan fit within that picture. Uh, his relationship with the Vatican today uh, brought about several things. One of them is the uh, diplomatic relationship with the Vatican. Second, the preparation for the signature of a concordat between the Vatican and the United States. And if you want to know, this never took place overnight. President Reagan was prepared and is here for the task that is performing today as President of the United States by the gestures of Rome and the time that he served as a star in a movie that was very well known and still being shown today, a very old movie, about the, the uh, uh, football team of Notre Dame. New Rockne. That's correct. <laughs> this is the time that the first contact was made by the Jesuits with Reagan. Jesuits under the stream of an induction, they were not directly to be involved. They only were the, uh, the, uh, the elements, the intellectual uh, element that will prepare this, the case of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, the person, uh, was uh, killed by the Jesuit of Rome, but there was no a Jesuit there involved directly. Nevertheless, it was the Jesuit who prepared the plot against his life and prepared and trained those who were to kill him. They arranged yeah. it. Yes, yeah. it happened with President Kennedy, the same thing. Yeah. Uh, the assassination of Kennedy is another, another fact um, uh, that is, can be proved of any time uh, that was ordered and, and, uh, uh, by the Jesuits in order to get rid of a president that already was ashamed to the Roman Catholic institution being Roman Catholic. You have two different streams. In Abraham Lincoln, you have that there was a man professing to be a Christian, solid Christian, and then there you have a man that professed to be a solid Catholic, but then put to shame his own uh, institution when he was confronted about what he will do as a Roman Catholic president about the Constitution and about the interests of the Roman Catholic institution. When he placed the Constitution of the United States above the canon laws of the institution, he called for disaster. Do you know anything about the assassination of President Kennedy and its connection with Catholicism? Well, I wouldn't like to dwell too much on that. But I know one thing, they told Professor, old President Kennedy that uh, they were coming back after he refused to sign the Proctor School Bill. And they told him that he better sign it when they come back. And there was head Catholic officials there to, to works. And it, the whole thing I'm quite sure was planned before they come back. They asked him to sign it and, and he said, I'm told the Protestant people that I wouldn't sign a bill, a poker bill, while I'm in office this term, and I won't. I'm as good as my word. I won't go back on my word. And uh, a short while after that, he was not a dead man. He was a vegetable. He uh, wasn't killed, but uh, his wife uh, knew all about it and called uh, uh, the Greek boat fellow and uh, told, told him he wanted him 
she told him, that he told her that he'd come and get, get him and take him over to his island. He was over on his island for some time, quite a while after that, when the whole family went over to the island, his, his family, Kennedy family, and they buried him out at sea. He was in the hospital on the Greek island for quite a while. What about the, like, the British royal family and uh, the oligarchical families of, of uh, northern Italy and some of these old families that have, you know, um, actually ruled for, for years and years and years? Do they have any connection with the Roman church today? A lot of them did. A lot of them ruled under the Roman church authority. You take Henry in Germany. He, he defied the Pope for a little while, and, and the Pope made him come and uh, humbled him to where he had to uh, s stand in the snow outside for days mm -hmm. before the Pope would even talk to him. But today you have you have ro a number of royal families still in existence in Europe. Yes, they're permitted. It's just uh, but the the head royal family of Britain don't amount to a hill of beans. They're just figureheads, pencil work. They don't have any power then. They really don't have as much power or any more power than you do. What connection do you see then between Jesuitism and the Illuminati? Well, the Illuminati is an outgrowth of uh, uh, papal plans to control the whole world. And uh, it was through the Illuminati that the papacy got a great deal of its control of Great Britain and the United States. And they control more than what people realize. This uh, Schiller Institute, I, have you you've heard about the Schiller Institute or the say, um, um, La Ruche's organization? Um, they're, they're the ones that organized and promoted this SDI. And uh, also their, their pretty extensive throughout the world. They've been putting a lot of people into office recently. And, um, but their focus, you know, all of these different magazines have a different focus. Their focus is to unveil the, ma the machinery of the, the British ruling family and some of these other families, showing their involvement in international dope trade. And, uh, and then they, they're into showing the dangers of the IMF and the, the banking well, fraud today. All that don't amount to hill of beans alongside of the, the giant octopus that controls behind the scenes. Mm. The whole thing is, you take in the United States, they let a lot of these things go because it works to their end. You take, if they demoralize the brains of the American youth, and to keep them undercover and so if they can't get out to get into things like they would if they didn't they use their brains and got up to the place where they should, why they can control the situation. So and the the drug trade is, is actually advantageous to the Roman church then. Absolutely and Russia's pouring tons and tons and hundreds of tons of drugs in here for that purpose. Their final goal, they have gold just like anybody has gold. And they have the final goal to take over this whole world and control of the whole world and everybody in it and have them in slavery underneath them. Wherever the Catholics have gone, the first thing they do is get the cities in debt. The next thing is to get the county in debt. The next thing is to get the state in debt. The next thing is to get the government in debt. That's how they got control of Great Britain. That's how they got control of the United States. And when they get control of one of the state, got control of the United States, now they're trying to get control of every country in the whole world. And they've got the world underneath a bind at the present time to where the economy is, where the, it works to a condition to where they take over. And they're, they're working for a one-world government, a one-world takeover, and uh, it's coming fast, faster than most people think. How did the Jesuits change the system of Protestant education? You know, just what did they do? And how is the Protestant education now different than it was 
say, prior to the, uh, the Anti-Reformation? Well, there's a lot of things that are different. There's no question about that. But they have worked up into the work of education and the, and the educational field to where they help to control the education. And they try to control the education to where they are ruling the morality and the Protestants that are being educated. Why would they? Why would they aim against morality? Isn't the Roman Catholic Church a Christian church, and wouldn't they want to teach morality? They want to get rid of the other Protestants, and they'll do anything that is up to their ability to do to do away with it. Let me tell you what the Knights of Columbus has done and performed a tremendous job in the United States in education, in public education. The authors of the chaotic situation of the public schools in the United States has been and are the Knights of Columbus in the United States. The Protestant churches never at any time uh, used the uh, theory of uh, uh, this here, what do you call it, in my ma mind, uh, rapture theory. It's a pure Catholic theory, and when the Jesuits got into the churches as ministers and teachers, they started teaching the rapture theory to the Protestant churches, and now the Protestant churches are all wrapped up in the rapture theory and teaching the rapture theory. What uh, what value is it to the Roman Catholics for Protestants to teach the rapture theory? It does away with the uh, uh, sanctuary service in heaven and uh, its work that's going on now according to the Holy Scriptures. How does the Roman Catholic Church fit into this rapture theory? Well, it came about as a result of Luther teaching that the Pope was the Antichrist and to get away from the teaching of the Pope being the Antichrist, they decided to try to get some other theory to out outdo it or overcome it. They first got one other theory that it was Antiochus Epiphanes that was the Antichrist. And none of the Protestants would accept that in those days. And so then they got the theory up of the rapture theory. And uh, none of them would accept that. But when they got enough Jesuits in the Protestant church to teach it as ministers and teachers, then they accept it, and today they're teaching it. What about the uh, work of Alcazar and Rivera? Now, these were two Jesuits that are starting already uh, way, uh, way back early, and the, uh, before the 1600s already, Rivera and Alcazar were already commissioned to penetrate uh, since uh, the infiltration was very difficult in the days uh, through the Reformation, they can uh, spot and infiltrate very easily in those days because of the battle, the struggle was face to face with the Vatican. Then uh, Roman Catholics and the Inquisitors, they have a hard time trying to infiltrate the Christian churches, even in Spain, where it was underground completely. They have a hard, difficult time, and there was a most very fearful thing to infiltrate, and nevertheless, they did it. They did infiltrate, and this is how they, uh, they, uh, um, they find many Christians uh, worshiping the Lord uh, in underground places. Now, uh, through infiltration. But in these cases, uh, they were not commissioned under the stream of an induction, as I was, uh, under the stream of an induction, Rivera and Alcázar, they were to work, and then later La Cunza. Uh, there is more, but I will mention these three, the most important ones, in dealing with one special area, prophecy. They were assigned to deal especially with prophecy, with the uh, purpose to do two things, at least, to cover up any prophecy related to the origin of the Antichrist, relate to the Antichrist, and uh, relate to the papacy, relate to the Antichrist. And second, to cover up any idea that the Roman Catholic institution was never a Christian church, as I pointed out before. What that means is to make possible in, in Bible commentaries and church history that the Roman Catholic institution always will appear as a Christian church falling apostasy 
and then uh, uh, we need a renewal, mm -hmm. and need a renewal. That was the idea that Rivera, Alcázar, and La Cruz tried to trace. Among other things, they tried to implement the idea that most of the prophecies of the Book of Revelations were already fulfilled by the time of Nero. Mm -hmm. What that means is that don't, for, don't worry about prophecies today, don't worry about the Antichrist, don't worry about a one world government, don't worry about nothing Futurism. like that. Yes, that's correct. Walter Martin uh, has been and confessed by him, as a matter of fact, I could mention that I have a debate already with Mr. Martin, I have already a debate with Mr. Ger uh, Gary Met, and I took them both by surprise. I took Mr. Gary Metz on radio by surprise. I not only persuade him, I force him to answer these accusations and these slanders. And then I took immediately Mr. Walter Martin and Anna Hain. And, and both gentlemen, they were not looking uh, really to meet with me. Uh, they were trying to avoid, if it were all possible, that confrontation that I did have with both. Uh, we have tapes of these confrontations and these debates. Mm. And then Mr. Walter Martin, he himself, even so that I knew his name and the list of very confident persons by the Jesuit order. What that means is that the Jesuit order will have a list uh, made up in United States of people as well as, in, as institutions they are worth trusting. And Mr. Walter Martin, I even mentioned to him in this confrontation with him that his name was listed in that list. What did he say? And he said to me, well, I don't know why my name is there. I said, you should know. He should know. Yes. I said, uh, you should know. As a matter of fact, why Mr. Walter Martin, 25 years ago, he even wrote about the cult to Mary, a book about Mary, and 25 years after, he have a list, as a matter of fact, that I have uh, with me, a list of, of cults where he lists the most dangerous cults and all who in the list of his most dangerous call are Christian signs, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, starting with the Mormons, and suddenly I thought, I was expecting that he will place at the top of the most dangerous cult Roman Catholicism, but where are the Mormons? Now, the Mormons become the victim of Roman Catholicism not only, but become the victim of Mr. Walter Martin, because even the Mormons are the product of Roman Catholicism. The pressure for Sunday in the future is an issue is that a product of the of the Jesuits, or, or what do you know about that? Well, what I know is this, that even the Seventh-day Adventist denomination yeah. has been placed under the greatest setup, and, and a real setup of all the history of the denomination. And the proof and evidence is that now the, the leadership is already uh, in a position where they themselves cannot play the role of uh, uh, Frankenstein no longer, because they're being unveiled, they're being discovered, and they're intense, and they're truly intense, and cases where uh, already most of them has been already uh, trained, prepared by Jesuits to be where they are. So, will, uh, this, this Sunday issue seems to be uh, on the president's desk to be signed. The moral majority is pushing for it. The Lawyers' Day Alliance has pushed for it from its inception. That was one of the reasons it was created. Yes. Um, so in other words, you think that the, the for example, the Adventist leadership are going to fold up? No, uh, th that is not true. No. In the, con the the how the denomination has been set up yes. and their uh, keeping of the Sabbath uh, is this. The Roman Catholic institution already, and this is why you had Bayakoki and some other elements within the denomination, there already has been even honor, honor, I mean, and condecorated by, by the Vatican uh, concerning uh, their work. And actually, the Roman Catholic institution uh, is preparing the greater surprise of them all, because it's not going to be even Sunday that they are going to be after. It's going to be Saturday, and you will see why. The reason of this is when already Catholicism already uh, came about 
with the idea during the Vatican Council II that a Roman Catholic Mass that was only to be performed on Sundays as to be the only valid Mass for Roman Catholic, even if they go any other day, Saturday, Friday, there was no valid a Mass for their obligations. Now, during the Vatican Council, the second session, suddenly the whole picture changed, and you know what for. The whole picture changed and said, now Saturday Mass is considered to be valid Mass as Sunday Mass. But that means not only that, more than that, Saturday Mass can replace Sunday Mass. But it's the Protestants, yes. not, not the Jesuits that, that appear to be pushing for the Sunday for national Sunday law. Yes, actually, actually, this is to trigger a reaction to really uh, make you for a cover-up. The issue here is not even Saturday, is not even Sunday. The issue here, whether it's Saturday or Sunday, the issue here is the person of the Antichrist. You see, in, in, in matters of days, right now, the conflict is is being utilized, the struggle between Saturday and Sunday is being utilized more for the benefit of Roman Catholicism than even for the benefit of the Christian Church. And that is how it has been exploited, to the point that already uh, the Vatican approved, listen to this, approved the publication officially of Viacocchi, see, and dealing with from uh, his book called From S uh, Saturday to Sunday. Now, if the Vatican go as far as a proven a publication as such, what do you think that is happening? Do you see the point here? Yeah. If the Vatican go as far, telling uh, uh, an official a member of the denominational body of the Seventh-day Adventist, I am the author of this book. I'm telling you that you have changed uh, 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 Saturday to Sunday, that you, uh, as a Roman Catholic, you were the one that changed it. I mean, openly, saying that there you did this. And the Cardinal Seven comes and says, oh, yes, we agree, we did this, we agree. Now, what are they trying to gain by doing this, by accepting this, what they are trying to gain? They are trying to gain the sympathy, they are trying to gain the life, and they're trying to gain the entire denomination as they have gained the Pentecostal, as, as they have gained the Protestants through different other issues. Nevertheless, they touch every other issue except the, as the real issue. Through any other issue, like the, the tongues business, the charismatic gift, you see, they are dealing with their things where they, nobody can see what is behind. In other words, uh, they cannot uh, openly see uh, uh, any evil uh, because uh, you will see the Vatican uh, uh, as a good, uh, uh, in a good position, a renewal position, say, yes, we recognize that we did wrong, we changed uh, uh, from Saturday to Sunday, and we admit this, and we're going to do something about it the Vatican Council did it. You see, we are going to incorporate now officially the Mass on, on the day of Sabbath. You see? So the Bible is clear. Oh, uh, yes. When they go that far, you can see one thing for sure. Now, there is, uh, in this issue, uh, uh, in my own uh, personal belief of the Scripture, you do not see that the issue in prophecy is one day or the other. The issue in prophecy is more than a day. It's more than a day. The issue in prophecy is who and where is the Antichrist now. Once that the person perceive the reality and the manifestation of this prophecy, they'll know the rest according to the scripture. But when a person is blind to the reality of who the Pope is, and the Pope is granting every favor to every other denomination. They'll believe that the Pope is not such a bad guy at all, after all. The whole thing is that they don't care what happens to people. Or who wins, as long as they come out. As long as they're out on top. Yeah. And they see to it that they're on top or it don't begin. Or they put an end to it. Now, they have in 
a short while past, said that there's too many of these proselyting people, proselyting people from South America uh, in, in the Catholic Church. And uh, there's too many people leaving the Catholic Church, and we've got to do something to stop it. And we're going to do something to stop it. And they've worked uh, and told the, the priest to that extent. And uh, that comes straight from the Vatican. Now, who is the proselyters? The main proselyters of Seventh-day Adventists, every week there's 10 to 11 and 12 churches being raised up. There are over 100 churches out of Catholicism in South America. The same thing in the countries above that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they said, we're plan we've got a plan on doing something about this, and we're going to do it. There's more opposition for it in the church than out of the church. Well, I'm wondering if there's, there's a certain amount of activity or infiltration in the church that would try to hold these things down from within. Well, there could be infiltration in the church without any question. Mm -hmm. But I, you can't say there is or there isn't until you know what you're talking about. They're wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And they're maybe a little wiser in some respects than what they were here a few weeks, a few years ago, in the fact that they don't let things out to stir up uh, indignation and get some people started. Mm. But there always is some, somewhere, somehow. Gathering information. Gathering information. There isn't a time when that won't happen. If you want to do some more work throughout the news media, you will find something. As a matter of fact, not only throughout the news media, but you will find something very interesting even throughout film industry. There are a lot of movies has come, and a lot of articles has been write up, and a lot of television shows has come out, and even movies and, and TV, and through radio, a lot of talk show has come out dealing with the very issues that I have dealt in these four parts of my testimony. They did not this before. Before 1979, over all these issues, everybody was quiet. Every other uh, reporter will never inquire about celibates and the problems of celibates, about lesbian, about gays within the clergy, about the mafia and the relationship of the bishops and the cardinals with the mafia and the clergy, about the uh, uh, about the banks, international bank situation with the Vatican uh, Bank. Nothing of this was ever dealt with except when these testimonies went out, then the news media start dealing, the film industry start dealing with priests that were unfaithful priests, cardinals that were unfaithful cardinals, bishops that were unfaithful bishops. As a matter of fact, even Jesuits within the Jesuit order were sent out immediately to answer to these very issues, to answer in their way. What that means is they went saying from every direction, yes, we recognize that there are priests involved with the mafia, there are even bishops, we recognize there are priests that they have broken their celibates and they have committed a, a fornication and they're still committing fornication, we recognize it. But you see, the church is another matter. The idea always was to tell the Catholic people, tell the Christian world, yes, these things uh, uh, happen, but this is isolated. This is uh, one priest, a bishop, a cardinal, someone that was unfaithful. But this is not the religion. This is not the system. This is not our belief. This is not our life. This is not our conduct. That is what they pretend to do. You have among even present Jesuits, um, uh, Hems Kahn, uh, the German Jesuits, and then you have Malachi's Martin. These men on their dispensation, dispensation, what that means, granting them the authority and the power by the Vatican and the, the Jesuit general to go out and uh, speak against the Pope, uh, speak against the liturgy, uh, uh, speak against the clergy, and they will not suffer as communion. 
You see that uh, they can go now uh, trying to deal with these very issues, trying to justify the regardless of all this commotion, of all this immorality, of all this corruption, of all these crimes. This is different uh, from the from the mother, from the system. Uh, that these are individuals within the clergy, but not the system. And of course, the system is the one that created them all. Has there been a, a certain promotion to create in the United States a, a special way of looking at Roman Catholicism? Oh yes, uh, yes. You mean type of propaganda, special for this yes, country? Yes, definitely. Uh, this is why they has been so successful here in the United States, being a, a, a country of a Protestant inheritance with a Christian beginning, uh, right in the 1620, where the pilgrims arrived to the northeast coast of this country, and suddenly today is making a, a concordat between the Vatican and the United States. Now, what that means? This is the greatest treason ever known to the very founders of this country. I mean, the most direct treason and betrayal that have taken place in this country has taken place and the fact that now this government uh, is looking for fellowship, for relationship with the very, with the very criminals that caused the greatest massacre in Europe, by which massacre and to which persecution the pilgrims arrived to the northeast coast of the United States. We were told that the United States would repudiate every principle of the Constitution, and I'm sure that that is not too far in the distant future. You know, an integral part of the papal policy was an organization called the Inquisition during the Middle Ages. It began in the 12th century under Innocent III, which was the most powerful of all the popes of that time period. The purpose of the Inquisition was to seek out heresy and stop it but it used some very unorthodox methods. One of those methods was to force certain confessions out of uh, Christians or others, and with those confessions, use them to form public opinion, to raise crusades, to destroy the primitive Christian church. Crusades went out that destroyed people by the millions. We'll not know how many until the Judgment Day. But the Inquisition, the Catholic Church said, well, yes, there was an Inquisition. Yes, we destroyed people. But it was part of the barbarity of the times. Others did it too. But of course, she claims that she's changed today, and Protestants are believing her. But you know, the Inquisition still exists, and it's actively being carried out. Beneath many of her large churches today are instruments of torture. I want you to listen to the testimony of Dr. Rivera as he begins to share with us about the Inquisition today. In your training and in your, your life as a Jesuit priest for many years, did you ever come to the point that you were required to destroy human life? Definitely. It's part of the oath and induction of any Jesuit that come under the oath and, in, and induction. And perhaps you care to, to know that uh, I have revealed a great deal of this in this uh, booklet after Alberto came out, uh, the first part of my testimony, yeah. dealing with my minor seminar and major seminar uh, as we went through these questions. And now you have a double cross. Uh, it is a revealing, at least a little part in these pages here, uh, page, uh, let's see, this is 12 and 13 at least. Uh, you see that is part of the oath and induction that I was uh, I was um, taking, uh, uh, as I swear, to take the life uh, not only of kings and princes and, and governors and mayors and, and senators and congressmen, uh, 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 but even my mother or father or brother or sister, whosoever, uh, come to be uh, 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 between the interests of the Roman Catholic system and, and, and the interests uh, that they pursued. What that means is, if a president uh, of a nation is, is there to interfere uh, with the interests of the Roman Catholic institution in their, in their pursuit of power, uh, they 
uh, they will be crushed. That they'll actually, um, uh, we were granted, I was granted that authority, that power, to exercise that authority, that power. That when any individual, whether it is a child, whether it is a le whether it is a woman, whether it is an elder man, whether it is a boy, whether it is a girl, uh, whether it is a king or a queen, uh, regardless of who the person is, when that person, that city, that nation, th this uh, country, opposed to the uh, goals of the Roman Catholic Institute and interfere with that already uh, call for disaster. What would you say has happened to the Inquisition? You know, right now there's, we don't see inquisitional tribunals, but we know that the goal of the church is still the same, and the engine of the Inquisition was set up all over the world. What's happened to that particular department of the church? It's still in force in one way or another. He said to this fellow, if you, if you weren't a Catholic, what would you be? He says, if the, the big Monsignor Segur said to him, said, if I wasn't a Catholic, I'd be a Seventh-day Adventist. And he says, Charlie, if I could get out of being a Catholic, I'd be a Seventh-day Adventist tomorrow. Is that right? And uh, he said, Charlie, he says, uh, uh, I, I, I advise you, if you can, to be a Seventh-day Adventist and join them. And uh, then uh, just a short while after that, it was uh, uh, the time when in the spring they don't, they have Good Friday and they don't eat uh, certain things and meet on certain days. And uh, they were having to go way out in the morning early and leave to their work. And so they had a special concession of the Chinese ca cafeteria that he was in, or restaurant, that uh, he would come down at 4 o'clock in the morning and fix their lunch and, and give them what they wanted to eat. And Charlie Hibbard says to him, said, why don't you order yourself up a good beef steak like I do? You know there's nothing to that. He says, well, he says, I don't mind to, I will. And while he was ordering up the beefsteak, he uh, says, I don't know, I feel funny about this. But, and he went ahead and they ate the beefsteak, and he had his half gone when three big dignitaries of the Catholic Church marched in to, t to find him and tell him about some of the work that he had to do. And when uh, they left, Charlie Hibbard looked at him and he, he says, he said to Charlie Hibbard, you don't know what this means to me. He says, I'll catch hell for this. And uh, he says, I used to be the head official that uh, did the punishment for the folks that weren't living up to what they're supposed to. And if you go back to the great big churches in New York, you'll find way down deep under the, in the basement, where the corners are cut off like corner cupboards would be. And I was the one that took the people that were sentenced and changed them in that corner, brought one brick and one trial of mortar each day and their meal until the, there was one opening for one brick. And I put in the last brick and the last trial of mortar. And uh, behind there, there's many skeletons. It says, you don't know, Charlie, what this means to me. I was the chief executioner for that, that deal. And me to eat beef steak like this? He said, I'll hear from this in a few days. He mm. says, that I'm from that tribunal back there. And said, you wait and see. In a few days, he got a notice that he was to appear before the tribunal in New York. And uh, when they left on a train, he said, Charlie, if I live, after this, said, if I live, I'll send you a card, greetings for your birthday. The card never came. I could tell you stories like this by the hours. So the Inquisitional Tribunal is still active for Roman Catholic people? It's still active, and it is for people who are not Roman Catholic if they get a chance to, without too much publicity that would damage them. Their work and their cause. Now in Mexico, they opened up the cloistered convents and turned some of them into museums. 
so tourists can see the torture implements that were used on the nuns. And uh, I imagine that in backward countries like Mexico and Spain and some of these areas, this type of thing keeps going without uh, interruption then. It's still done in America to some extent, too, in the United States of America. Yes, and I've seen in some of the basements where they're building some of their churches where they're preparing to put some of those things in. They actually have cells and things underneath. The they have building. cells underneath, way down, not only one story, but stories and stories below. There is enough uh, left of the old Inquisition. I will say there is, uh, there is a new Inquisition today, not even tomorrow, it's at work today, <laughs> in here, uh, even in the United States, and has been always. Uh, there is uh, no replacement of a, uh, a new Inquisition replacing the old. No. What happened is that the old Inquisition, as the years went by, uh, under the a sponsorship and guidelines of the Jesuit uh, general and the Jesuit order, they has been they has been changing their devices and their and their tools uh, and their and their um, uh, and their I will say their devices their and their methods. You see, what happened is the Inquisition is the same Inquisition. The Holy Office never closed the door since it was established in 1200. You see, it never closed the door. As a matter of fact, within the Vatican, within the Vatican, this is an office that never closed the door day and night. Today have a different name. It happened that they have a different name today as they have different devices and methods to, uh, to uh, uh, bring people to trial. Today, the Inquisition is at work. As a matter of fact, you have a book here that is called uh, Night Journey from Rome uh, uh, that we uh, came uh, uh, to publish. A Night Journey from Rome is one of the last converted Roman Catholic priest in the United States, an American priest that was converted to Christ in his gospel about two years ago and came with us to the reading of Alberto, the first part of my testimony. He was Clark Butterfield, is his name, a Californian priest. There is the book here, Night Journey from Rome, and here is the most revealing thing about the actual Inquisition in the United States. He was so much aware of the reality of that Inquisition that in his own will, he prevent even his relatives, his own relatives, his own mother, his own relatives, from bringing his body to the Roman Catholic parish the day that he was ready to depart to be with his Lord and Savior. And he almost prophesied, and I will, because exactly that was the intention. Immediately that he was killed and murdered, killed, murdered by the Jesuits of Rome and Detroit, Michigan, through a Roman Catholic doctor, member of the Knights of Columbus. Mm -hmm. Then you can see the Inquisition is alive and well, with different devices, different methods, and a different name. Today they call the office for the preservation of the doctrine and the faith. We were trained in many different things, from chemistry uh, uh, to po for poisons, uh, to uh, uh, warfare of any kind. Uh, and of course, uh, we were not to be involved in these things. Uh, let me explain this. Uh, Jesus, under the stream of an induction, they were not directly to be involved. They only were the uh, the uh, the elements, the intellectual uh, element that will prepare this. The case of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, the president, uh, was uh, killed by the Jesuits of Rome, but there was no a Jesuit there involved directly. Nevertheless, was the Jesuit who prepared the plot against his life and prepared and trained those who were to kill him. They arranged yeah. it. Yes, yeah. it happened with President Kennedy, the same thing. Yeah. Uh, the assassination of Kennedy is another, another fact um, uh, that is, can be proved of any time. Does the idea of assassination, murder, persecution, and suffering bother you? It really shouldn't. I remember when a Roman Catholic priest stood here in this studio and told me that they were watching me and that they were serious about any threat to what they wanted to do. I told him, go ahead, shoot. What difference does it make? 
As long as I'm alive, I'll present this truth. But if I die, then my troubles are over. Everyone that will be in heaven will have suffered for Christ. When we get there, our master will have scars in his hands. And only if we suffer will we feel we have a perfect right to that place. In fact, in Revelation 12, verse 11, we read, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. This message we have to give, we've got to give without worrying about consequences. It's a divine message of truth. It can't fail. We're fulfilling the prophecies of the closing events, and it's going to go through to completion. It's time for all of us Adventists to wake up, give up the things of this world, and go forward and give this message. Now, I want you to listen very carefully as Dr. Rivera and Dr. Dukes share these thoughts with you. The Lord is still in control. The Catholics are going to do what they're going to do. And there's nothing we can do about it, only just go out and do what we can to warn other people and get them into the right channel. The future of Catholicism, according to the prophecy in chapter 17 of the book of Revelation, is what even the Holy Spirit used to convict me to leave at once a Roman Catholic system. That means there was no hope. I became a Christian within the Roman Catholic institution, and I want to stay within as many there to help the others. And there, from 17 to 18, God revealed to me there was no hope within the institution. Why haven't they removed the Adventist church thus far, then? Because the good Lord has had a hand in things, otherwise it would have been done, and that's positive in my way of thinking. Mm -hmm. But they ha have plans for the Adventist church now, and they have plans on fixing it so they can't buy or sell. The best advice is based uh, for Roman Catholic is to come out of her, that is, God's decrees, come out of her, my people. For that? Christians is what the book of Ephesians chapter 5 uh, relate. He said clearly, do not have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. What fellowship Rebuke of Rebuke them. That is the position of a Christian, and that is called by the Holy Spirit. I will say these are the two most most urgent message to be communicated to the Roman Catholics to come out of her, to the Christian, keep out of her, keep out of their fellowship. There is no fellowship, the light with darkness. The seventh day is the Sabbath, and that God still reigns, and no matter what happens, no matter what the Catholic Church does, no matter what the Jesuit does or what their plans are, God's behind the scenes and he's with us. We have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Do you believe there is Christians among the Roman Catholics? There are any Christians? And the person says, yes, there are Christians. Oh, I know. My own mother, my own father, you'll see. Uh, they don't believe in all these things. They just go there to witness about Christ. But they are truly Christians. You see the point here. They will say she was not a Christian church, she's not a Christian church, she will not be, but they come and tell you there are Christians within the Roman Catholic institution. That is impossible. A person who is convicted under the Holy Spirit, being a Roman Catholic, the first thing that the person felt and know that she or he must do is to leave Roman Catholicism. Because Roman Catholicism leave first from then and then they leave after. You see, even a person that leave Roman Catholicism without being a Christian, Roman Catholicism is still with the person. What that means is they can leave the physical system, but Roman Catholicism is still with the person. Only Christ can eradicate from the root Roman Catholicism from the heart of a person. It's amazing to hear these messages coming from someone who's not even a Seventh-day Adventist. But we're told that the majority of those that will give this message will come out of the Catholic and the Protestant churches during the loud cry in the latter rain. In fact, very, very few that now profess the truth will press their way through the narrow way that leads to life eternal and be saved at last. Brethren, I don't want any of you to be lost. The message we have is just too important right now.
There are those that are arising in our church today which are undermining our historical position on prophecy and trying to get our people to join in a more ecumenical posture with the churches of this world. While on the other side, on the conservative side of things, there are those who are rising up and trying to take our historical prophecies and reapply them into the future, weakening the historical message of Adventism. It's time for Adventists everywhere to begin to restudy out the messages that made us the people that we are and to present those messages with power before the world under the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, it's time that the Sabbath be presented to the world more fully. We have gathered here in our studio pictures and film from every corner of the globe showing that the Sabbath was kept in every country right down through the centuries. We've been able to show that in the early centuries that the Sabbath was kept by all the Christian churches but Rome and Alexandria. This message needs to go out, and we need your help, and we need your prayers. We can't do it alone. We need all Adventists everywhere to help us. Would you please have prayer with me as we close? Dear Lord in heaven, now as we face the last years in the great drama, we pray that you will move upon the hearts of Adventists everywhere to raise up workers to finish this work. Move upon the hearts of those who see this program to set aside this world and prepare for the coming of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the New World Order. Expect no mercy. Gods of the New Age, a fascinating and disturbing motion picture which traces the history and occult origins of today's New Age philosophy, from its beginnings in mystic India to its mass infiltration into Western culture. The S. Naipaul, himself an Indian, describes India as a wounded civilization paralyzed by her religious beliefs. This complex and contradictory religion known as Hinduism promotes the worship of enlightened godmen called gurus. And countless idols. Incredibly, the West is today looking to Hinduism's superstitions for hope. The religion that has all but destroyed India has now infiltrated every area of Western society. Protesting that it is not religious but scientific, it is transforming our minds, science, medicine, mass media, politics, and the church. Hinduism is most seductive when it wears the mask of Christian terminology and has shockingly managed to disguise itself as the latest Christian thought. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order, your generation will not only be creating a new world, but will also live in it. Much of it will certainly be different from whatever we can imagine now. Why did Gorbachev mention the new world order? Is there a movement in the world today that is striving to have a one world government? As we look at our dollar bill, we see a pyramid with the all-seeing eye on the top. Under that pyramid is an unrolled scroll with the words Novus Ordo Seclorum. Why were these words on the dollar bill? Let's see what one writer has to say about this. On the back of every dollar bill, starting with the 1928 silver certificate, is the symbol of Adam Weishaupt's dream and the goal of the insider, the eye over the pyramid with the year 1776 inscribed into the base of the pyramid in Roman numerals. Bannered beneath the pyramid are the words Novus Ordo Seclorum, 
meaning new world order. New world order. These are the words that Gorbachev used when he addressed the United Nations. Today, the United Nations is gaining power. United Nations. All these European countries belong to the United Nations. And the United Nations is gaining power today. Listen to the news and you will see that the United Nations will hold a big part in the end movements of this world. My wife and I feel like the most wonderful gift that God has given us is our children. We want them to have the same kind of happiness that we had in being raised as a Christian, knowing of Jesus Christ. But there seems to be a sinister movement at our foot in this country, a tremendous movement to bring every man, woman, and child into the occult. It's just behind the scenes of the media, and yet it's there in everything around us, in entertainment. We see it in television and in the movies and on the radio. It's in the elementary school systems, the public school systems, colleges. We see it in the business world and advertisement. It's almost impossible to live in this world without being influenced by it. So we've taken our children out of school and we're educating them at home. And we don't have a television in our home. We try to avoid those things on the radio and music forms that would bring our children in contact with the occult world. If parents only realize the tremendous movement that is underfoot today and the effect that it's having on the minds of adults and children, they would be far more protective and more careful. We have kids being killed. We have uh, people missing in America. We have our own MIAs right here. We have cattle being killed. We have all types of perversion going on, and it's affecting America. The children were given um, were given knives and told to go and stab those bodies. They described uh, a satanic goat's head being on the wall over the table. They described um, a lot of candles um, and they described people in black and white robes with hoods. We were taught to aid in the kidnapping of children. What they would do is uh, the kids would go and play with the children and then tell them that they were either going to go to a party or that there was some toys or whatever and get them so they weren't on the move and then her father and other members would grab the kids. Do you find missing children sometimes fall prey to these people? I believe that they do. I can't, we can't prove that they do. But as a law enforcement officer, I question two million children missing in the United States knowing that many, many of those are not runaways and are so young that they couldn't run away anyway. One of their primary aims is to, de to destroy the belief system within a child, to make a child turn against what they believe in in terms of who they are, of who God is, uh, and to desecrate all manner of flesh, all manner of church institution, all manner of sign and symbol that a child could in any way... The information available today concerning the rise of the occult this is documented evidence that the scriptural prophecies are true, that a loving God has tried to warn mankind. Then why will so many people be deceived? It's because most people would just like to pretend that nothing of a conspiratorial nature is happening. Most people read very little, and when they do, it's almost never outside the realm of the controlled media or novels or popular history. Many would like to ignore the Bible prophecies completely and believe that the future will be that of peace and prosperity. But to the honest and hard, it's becoming more and more difficult to pretend that everything's okay. The, ma the material I'm about to share with you can all be found in current publications. And although the warnings are more horrifying than any fiction, the inroads of spiritualism must clearly be presented to those who are willing to listen. The Luciferian conspiracy begins with the lie that man is immortal. Nothing has caused more heartache than the loss of a loved one, nor any question more stirring than where will I go when I die. As you and I look in the mirror, we see the wrinkles form in the gray hairs. We are dying while we're alive. Death is stalking as a relentless predator, 
we never know where or when it's going to strike next it may be a loved one or even ourselves if a lying spirit made contact with us from the dead we'd certainly believe it wanting to believe that our loved one is alive or that there is life for ourselves beyond the dead Among the mountain solitudes of northern Italy, a people exiled to the wilderness kept the light of truth burning throughout the darkness of the Middle Ages. God had provided for his people a sanctuary of awful grandeur, befitting the mighty truths committed to their trust. To those faithful exiles, the mountains were an emblem of the immutable righteousness of Jehovah. They were a constant witness to God's creative power and a never-failing assurance of his protecting care. God, who had set fast the mountains and girded them with strength so that no arm but that of infinite power could move them out of their place, in like manner had established his law, the foundation of his government in heaven and upon earth. God has given his people a tremendous task in this world and all need wisdom carefully to search out the mystery of iniquity. In the very time in which we live, the Lord has called his people and has given them a message to bear. He has called them to expose the wickedness of the man of sin. Testimonies to Ministers 118 and in Great Controversy 606 we read, the sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of papal power, all will be unmasked and by these thousands who have never heard words like these before will be stirred. In the ancient world, the ancient system of pagan idolatry gave place to the monstrous cathedrals that exist in Europe today. 
but still on these cathedrals we see remnants of the origin of this system. Spain reached a tremendous climax during the 15th and 16th century in her colonies around the world. And we see in Spain the great power of the Catholic Church. It was in Spain that the Inquisition was set up with a tremendous power. 68 million people were destroyed there alone. The early Christians had spent many years suffering at the hands of persecution. And as the church became corrupt, they separated. We find in the history of the Wallenses by Wiley and the Wallenses by Claudiana, a book written in Rome, that the early Christians who wanted to stay pure and stay faithful to the apostolic faith removed themselves into the mountain home. And so Satan moved. In Great Controversy 234, we read, at this time the order of the Jesuits was created the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery, cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affections, reason and conscious holy silence. They knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power to be developed to the overthrow of Protestantism and the reestablishment of the papal supremacy. When appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity, but under the blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. It was a fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable, but commendable when they served the interests. The Jesuits were given tremendous power. At first, there was only 60 of them allowed, but in time, they were given full control of the church. Yea, they were given power to excommunicate all who would hinder or do not aid the society, to confer orders, preach, and minister sacraments, to change their general, to, to change their general, to absolve heretics as well as imprison the excommunicate, to exercise episcopal functions, to confirm, exercise, dispense, etc., to disguise themselves, to carry movable altars, give plenary indulgence, to live exempt, free from secular power, taxes, as well as juris jurisdiction authority, sentence, and command of any other ordinary delegate, judge, magistrate, from any search. Folks, it illustrates that the church in society gave the Jesuit absolute control in this world, total free from all law. The ceremony of induction of the Jesuit is in the Library of Congress in the card is 6643354. It's an unbelievable admission to the world of what goes on in the initiation of a Jesuit into the profess. The Jesuit oath, my son, you have been taught to act a dissembler among the Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic and to be a spy even among your own brethren, to believe no man, to trust no man, among the reformers to be a reformer, among the Huguenots to be a Huguenot, among the Calvinists to be a Calvinist, among the Protestants generally, be a Protestant. And obtaining their confidence to speak to seek to speak from their pulpits and to denounce with all vehemence in your nature our holy religion and the Pope and even to descend so low as to become a Jew among the Jews that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. You have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between states that were at peace and incite them to deeds of blood involving them in war with each other and to create revolutions and civil wars in communities, provinces, and countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences, enjoying the blessing of peace. To take sides with the combatants and to act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that with which you might be connected. Only that the church might be the gainer in the end and the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace and that the end justifies the means. You have been taught your duties as a spy to gather all statistics, facts, and information in your power from every source. To ingratiate yourself into the confidence of the family circle of the Protestants and heretics of every class and character as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, among the schools and universities, in parliaments and legislatures and in the judiciaries and councils of state and to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. You've received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, and have served as a coadjutor, confessor, and priest. But you have not yet been invested with all that is necessary to command in the army of Loyola in the service of the Pope. You must serve the proper time as the instrument and executioner, as directed by your superiors. For none can command here 
who has not consecrated his labor with the, with the blood of the heretic. For without the shedding of blood, no man can be saved. Therefore, to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure, you will, in addition to your former oath of obedience to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me. I promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants, liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable race, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the pinyard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever they may, may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith, the Society of Jesus. Could they carry out these kinds of monstrous oaths? They can because of the secret of the exercises. In Bomer's book on the Jesuits, we read, we imbue into him spiritual forces which he would find very difficult to eliminate later. These forces can come up again to the surface. Sometimes after years of not even mentioning them and become so imperative that the will finds itself unable to oppose any obstacle and has to follow the irresistible impulse. From the site of Noah's Ark to the depths of the Red Sea, the grandeur of Mount Sinai and the ash ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah, these and other new surprising discoveries are brought to life in this series by international explorer, archaeologist and author Jonathan Gray. In October of 1988, Ron returned to Israel to begin excavation again after an absence of several years on the Ark of the Covenant. Since the last time Ron had worked there, the Department of Antiquities had had a complete turnover of personnel and policy. Permits to excavate were tough to get for institutions and tougher still for individuals. But Ron took his crew over and went to apply. He had been told years earlier that his permit to excavate the site was permanent. However, it didn't look so good this time. So he reapplied and for three weeks they all waited. Finally, Ron took the crew to the Mediterranean Sea at Ashkelon to go for a swim in October. Here, Ron stubbed his toe on something in the waist high water Diving to see what it was, he discovered the mouth of a giant stone pot. Soon, they discovered the area to be littered with these pots with sealed mouths. Prying one open, they discovered that they were burial pots full of human remains. Ron went directly to the Department of Antiquities with the find. They were greatly excited for it turned out that these were the ancient Canaanite burial pots of Ashkelon. The great Kathleen Kenyon had bulldozed through the entire Roman level here, searching for the burial site of these ancient people. Yet no one thought of looking just a few hundred feet out in the shallow waters of the Mediterranean. While no one could wonder the significance of this discovery as compared to Noah's Ark or the chariot parts, we must say there is no significance in that respect. However, Ron immediately got his permit to excavate in Jerusalem. Unlike his other projects, Ron was digging in this site based only on a statement he had made one day in 1978 to a head of the Department of Antiquities in Jerusalem. While walking together in this area, they were discussing Roman antiquities when Ron's left hand pointed to a site and he said, that's Jeremiah's grotto and the Ark of the Covenant is in there.
Jesus is coming soon. And before he does, there'll be a tremendous deception in the Christian world. Paul describes a deception taking place in his time in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. We read that there were false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, or truth. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. It's hard for us to imagine that religious leaders throughout the years may have brought into the church false doctrines. But the fact is that just before Jesus comes, two groups of Christians will be formed. There'll be one group that is waiting for Jesus and ready for him when they see him in the clouds of glory. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, we read a description of them. Here is the patience or endurance of the saints. Here are they that keep or obey the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, the experience of Jesus. Another group is brought to view that are lost when God comes to this earth. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 9, we read, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Movements through the skies was carefully marked. They saw that it passed through a consistent path in the heavens. This path they called the zodiac. During the day, they saw the sun as a good god, but at night, a dark and evil god. The union of the god who ruled the sky and the seas gave rise to many myths and many strange creatures. The number six was the day that man was born on or created on and believed to be the day the serpent was made on. Thus it represented man, woman, and the serpent. There were six houses given for the sun to pass through in the zodiac during the day and six houses in the night. In each one of those houses, the sun passed through three rooms. This formed 36 rooms in the zodiac, 36 manifestations of the sun, the ancients believed. There were 36 gods in the zodiac, one for each one of these rooms, 36 gods in all to rule the 36 constellations of the sky. The number 1 through 36 added up equals the summary number of the mystery god, the hidden one. The 666 God. These superstitious mystics gave the number 666 to the sun. They believed that the serpent power resided in the sun and they worshiped this force in nature as a great seven-headed dragon. Each one of its heads representing one of the planetary gods, the sun, moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, as her own purpose 
is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. I was just playing. What can I do for you? Oh, you want to know about the history of the Sabbath? You're going to have to ask my dad about that. He's in the library. Let's go see him. My dad has a big library, and he can answer all the questions you have. Oh, hi. What can I do for you? This little girl wants to know about the history of the Sabbath. Well, come on in. I'll answer your questions for you. This is one of my favorite little books. It's called The Sabbath of God Through the Centuries by Elder Coldheart. And you know, that book tells about the Sabbath kept in every century. You can hold that. That's nice. This book here was written in the 19th century by a man named J.N. Andrews, and it tells about the Sabbath kept all the way through the time of the Great Reformation. And that book shows that there were Sabbath keepers all over Europe. In fact, this book shows that that book is true. It's called The Sabbath in Scripture and History, and it shows that some Sabbath keepers are still keeping the Sabbath today after 2,000 years, the Ethiopians and the Armenians. This book called Facts of Faith tells the same story. It came out in the 1940s. This one's my favorite. It's called Truth Triumphant, and it tells about the Sabbath kept all over the world, even through China and Japan. B.G. Wilkinson traveled all over the world gathering quotations. This book here by Brian Ball tells us that the pilgrims or the Puritans of England, many of them kept the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. Many people don't know that, I know. And the Sabbath and Sunday in early Christianity by Mr. Odom tells the same story. The Sabbath was kept all over the world for the first five centuries. There are some books that aren't written by Christians that tell the same story, like this book from Bangor, Ireland. And we got this in Ireland. See, isn't that a pretty picture? And it says that those Irishmen kept Beautiful. the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath. This book here tells about the old Silk Road of, of China and Turkestan. And it shows that the old Sabbath-keeping Christians kept the Sabbath throughout China and even were responsible for bringing knowledge to those parts of the world. I have a lot more books, but I don't really know just what you want. Will these books help you? No. They're nice books, but I can't read very good, and I need books with lots of pictures. Oh, I have some slides and some movies. 